For a while now, we've examined major Disney efforts. Through the life of John Hench and artists central to animation, live action, and theme park projects. In our last episode, the WED designers toured research plants at American companies to develop ideas for the city that Walt wanted to build in Florida. Over months, managers from WED visited dozens and dozens of companies searching for ways to elevate Walt's plans towards a type of near perfection. And in today's episode, designers work to integrate that information into more robust plans for a Disney model city. By the start of 1966, WED had expanded into new facilities on Flower Street, allowing the division to better group offices according to specialization. The company also founded a subsidiary division called MAPO, focused on the development of animatronics and sets required for both the theme park and the studio. MAPO, named after the Disney film Mary Poppins and started with money from its success, further expanded out elements of role specialization at WED. As with the studios, where during its early years Walt had improved the quality of American animation by asking artists to focus their efforts in one area of production, from story to layout to effects animation to background. He was now following the same path at WED as the team moved toward the Florida projects. Though for years each artist or engineer had generally had an area of specialization as the theme park division grew. Walt formalized out those arrangements by subdividing departments and divisions, likely believing that heightened specialization would lead to increased quality as it had decades earlier in animation. The increased specialization also allowed Walt to more carefully choose where and how he spent his time at WED. Whereas at the Sonora Street location, WED had been largely situated around the model shop which occupied a central space in the complex, the new WED facilities were now divided among multiple buildings, multiple divisions. In this environment, Walt could easily focus on the projects that most interested him. The new theme park for Florida was mostly left up to designers who had worked on the California park. Walt believed that they mostly needed to adapt and replicate attractions designed for or built at Disneyland. Walt was interested in those areas not previously explored in California. He was interested in the hotels. During 1966, Walt believed that the Florida hotels would largely be themed environments relating to areas of the park. There would be a hotel themed after the Western Frontier area. There would be one modeled after the turn of the century Main Street. One of the largest hotel areas would be a colonial enclave related to Liberty Square, the early American exhibit that he had once planned for Disneyland. Another large area of development would be a Polynesian-themed hotel, loosely related to the Tiki Room and Adventureland. As WED managers focused in on patterns of Florida tourism, they became increasingly concerned that Disney World would compete with the Florida coast if they wanted guests to stay on property for more than a couple of days. The Polynesian Hotel, with man-made beaches, was an attempt to manage those expectations. But the area that continued to interest Walt more than any other was the experimental city. When visiting WED, Walt would typically drive over from the studio by himself. His brother Roy would later claim that WED remained Walt's domain, even after it was folded into Walt Disney Productions, so much so that Roy only visited the facility a few times while Walt was alive. When visiting, Walt might check on new plans for Disneyland, particularly those for the revised Tomorrowland. He might check on plans and reports for a ski resort he wanted to build in the Mineral King section of the Sierras. But his main concern was the city, the plans for which were arranged in a specially designed room with maps and aerial photos hung across the walls. As planning continued, Walt's approach took on larger philosophical concerns, not just on improved living space, but what the city would represent. According to Marvin Davis, Walt didn't just want, quote, to build a city that would solve all the problems or the urban difficulties that are all over the world now. 
but to do something where there would be a chance for American industry to experiment and show to the world just how problems could be solved, problems of housing and problems of traffic. He figured that if we could create a community in which people living there could be a constant source of testing out materials, ideas, and philosophies, not only just physical things, but educational developments in all forms of communication, as well as the governmental things. That could be solved, too. As work progressed, Walt's desire to create a pedestrian-focused city remained central to his plans with many green areas open for residents to enjoy. To achieve these goals in a modern city, Walt's team imagined a four-level transportation grid. Above the ground would glide the monorail and the Wedway people mover. The ground itself would largely be arranged as pedestrian space. Beneath the ground would be two sets of tunnels. The upper tunnels would be for cars with access to parking garages and to a few surface streets. The lower tunnels would be for trucks with access to various loading docks and delivery areas. In most American cities, a network of roads, especially highways, tended to geographically divide neighborhoods. But pedestrian open space engendered social connections between one community and the next. Walt's traffic plan was not only to minimize the use of cars, but to limit how roads divide communities. Another focus concerned internationalism. As at Disneyland, where Walt had once imagined a gathering of world pavilions similar to a World's Fair or an Olympic Village, he now exported and expanded those plans for Epcot. His city would feature an international marketplace with food, art, music, and crafts from around the world. More than once, he discussed these plans with John Hench. Quote, Walt thought he'd establish a kind of place that was practical, explained Hench, but where people would be introduced to other cultures and learn to drop their prejudices. Many cultural elements would be arranged in the downtown district an area open not only to Epcot residents, but to tourists as well. Quote, Walt thought he could make it work, Hench added, with a strong educational side to it, but also fun and pleasant. He also thought that exposing people to each other's culture would prove to be very beneficial. Walt felt that since we all have a common basis, our need to survive and for the right understanding about others, and since our separate survival patterns have become sanctified into cultures, he could make this interchange work. As for who would live in the city, Walt struggled to find an answer. Though he initially considered that there might be a section for retirees, he later saw Epcot as a type of company town with residents connected to either Epcot industry or to the tourist areas. Quote, people living there would be working for Disney, Marvin Davis explained, or for some of the companies that would be in the industrial park. In other words, he really wanted to open this thing up to American industry. Along with this, Walt hoped that the unique authority over building and zoning codes, if approved by the state of Florida, would prove an incentive for American companies to invest in an Epcot industrial park. There they could build structures that might be more difficult to permit elsewhere in the U.S. Along with better education and health systems, Walt looked for ways that a planned city could improve the lives of teenagers who, in the mid-1960s, were often alienated from adult culture and traditional values, and, as a result, tended to rebel from community elements that might provide guidance as they grew up. Quote, Walt was greatly interested in solving the young adult problem that faces everybody, Davis continued, if we can successfully show to the world an area where the teenagers are properly controlled and given an opportunity to express whatever they have to do with the world and keep them occupied. In one conversation with Davis, Walt said, I think this is something we really want to work on, referring to the way that Epcot would improve conditions for people at all stages of life, including teenagers. During these months, as Walt worked through philosophical concerns, he looked for ways that these ideas would shape the physical environment. Epcot as a city would have a thesis, a controlling idea that would guide how it was laid out and how technology was integrated into its plans. Quote, 
Walt always knew when contradictions crept into a film or into studio projects, Hench explained, he could put his finger on them right away. He applied this to a city. He studied what made it work and not work. It would be a city of ideas, a place of possibilities. The visual center would be a massive tower, rising 30 or so stories with glass windows and capped with an ornamental spire. Just as the castle, with its elevated turrets, visually oriented guests in Disneyland, the Glass Hotel rising from the downtown area would function as a visual anchor to orient guests moving through Epcot, an icon that suggested they were in a city different from others around the country. During these months, Hench continued to plan out a revised Tomorrowland, an area of the park that would feature some elements also planned for Epcot, such as the people mover and industrial displays of new technology. Rocket to the Moon was updated as Flight to the Moon. Among the technological displays was a new exhibit sponsored by Monsanto. By this point, Hench was familiar with executives from Monsanto as they had sponsored two previous exhibits in Tomorrowland, the Hall of Chemistry and the House of the Future. Monsanto wanted to showcase new synthetic fabrics they believed would revolutionize the fashion industry. But to do so, they agreed to sponsor an attraction long explored by WED, one that years ago was earmarked for the never-built science pavilion in Tomorrowland, an attraction that was described by Walt in 1957 as a, quote, protozoa ride that would take patrons into a drop of water as seen through a microscope. The new Monsanto attraction, updated from that original concept and eventually called Adventure Through Inner Space, was arranged as a journey in which guests explored the world of the water molecule. In terms of design, it would be an attraction in direct opposition to the current emphasis areas of WED. In the mid-1960s, WED was largely focused on the ways that audio animatronics could transform amusement shows and dark rides such as Pirates of the Caribbean and The Haunted Mansion. But Adventure Through Inner Space would be designed as a dark ride without a single animatronic, without a single human or animal figure, aside from the recorded voice of the narrator. It would be an attempt to evoke drama through set design as guests moving through showrooms seemingly shrunk down to the size of a single snowflake and then to the size of atoms that make up an individual water molecule. It was a contrarian decision, similar to those that framed Fantasia. Fantasia, which was partially a presentation of abstract and non-representational animation, appeared at a time when Disney had spent millions developing his artist's ability to animate realistic human and animal forms. Now for Walt's theme park. Hench was drawn back to those early days as he worked to develop a ride that put aside the most important artistic and engineering advancements developed by WED in the previous five years. Instead of a project focused on characters, which was the basis for every attraction developed for the World's Fair, Hench would oversee development on a ride focused on environment. To develop this ride, he worked with his old friend, Claude Coates. Years earlier, when working on an animated film, Hench would lay out the scenes and Coates would adapt those plans into a series of painted backgrounds. Now Hench helped to conceptualize the attraction, and Coates developed those ideas into workable show stages that defined the ride. It would be an experience almost wholly focused on sets and backgrounds, as those wet artists who specialized in character animation, such as Mark Davis, were focused on Pirates of the Caribbean. Compared to those rides developed in recent years, such as It's a Small World, this one would move through a relatively small building, containing showrooms with space enough at times to only feature stage designs on one side of the track. In a large building, such as Disney had used for the Ford Magic Skyway, designers could create show elements that encircled guests as they traveled through the attraction. But here it would be important to focus a guest's attention in one direction.
Previous dark rides had focused the attention of guests through lighting and sound cues, but here the Disney team wanted to use a ride system that would better control how guests visually experienced the attraction. For this, Hench and his team looked to another unbuilt Disney attraction. As part of an effort to combine entertainment with education, in the early 1960s, Walt and his team had briefly collaborated with the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles to design a ride that would move guests through museum space and tar pit areas, a ride that, by necessity, would focus guests' attention on one scientific exhibit at a time. For this, Disney engineer Bob Gurr developed a unique ride system, one that not only moved guests through an attraction, but turned ride vehicles from side to side, directing them at specific scientific displays. These vehicles, mounted on a central pole, could swivel the front-facing section of the car from one side of the track to the other. Once he added a high curved back and sidewalls, the little vehicles allowed guests to only see what was directly in front of them. In film, a camera focused the shot, so the audience experienced the scene from the same perspective. In these ride vehicles, soon to be called Omnimovers, designers could now manage how guests experienced each show stage, rotating the vehicle toward one display, then rotating it toward another. For ride designers with a background in film, this invention allowed them to lay out a ride in terms of precise visual progressions, much in the way they had once laid out animated movies. Outside of the Monsanto attraction, Hench plotted out a course for the People Mover. Initially, the People Mover was intended to cover wide areas of the park with its elevated track extending all the way over to Storybook Land at the far side of Fantasyland. But the ride quickly became a tour of Tomorrowland, with the track moving in and out of buildings as though it were taking guests to different stations. In Hench's drawings, he arranged elegant cars and arched track supports, which together emphasized the concept of movement, the visual suggestion of a world on the move. Quote, on the Wedway People Mover, the structural forms are designed to support physical forms in motion, he explained. The cantilevered and curved track and the widening curves in the structural elements create continuous eye movement for guests because the eye interprets the line as the record of action. Still, it wasn't a transportation system that carried guests from one location to another, rather an example of how near-future systems like this one might soon transform cities. At the back of Tomorrowland, Hench situated a new two-story carousel theater to feature the Carousel of Progress, originally developed for the World's Fair with an updated final act. In early designs, the upper story featured the Carousel Show, while the bottom story featured a GE Medallion Home of the Future, highlighting GE appliances similar to the GE display at the World's Fair. But as plans developed, the Medallion Home fell away, in its place, a model of a futuristic city, similar to the one that Walt was planning for Florida. Guests, after watching the carousel show, would board slow-moving ride vehicles, little cars arranged on a narrow track called GEMS, which stood for General Electric Mobiles. In these cars, guests slowly circled down toward the model city displayed on the first floor of the theater building. George McGinnis, who was hired by Walt in June 1966, recalled his work on this project. Quote, that was the first project I worked on. It turned out I designed all modes, from rapid transit to the little golf carts for the model. I didn't design monorails for the model, for GE made only rapid transit trains. Just like Epcot, this model city arranged in miniature for Disneyland would feature electric mass transportation and pedestrian walkways. It would have a tall glass skyscraper at its center, like a castle marking the downtown district, and then residential homes in neighborhood clusters buffered by green space. Over months, the presentation would change. The gem vehicles would fall away, as would the ride track. The location of the carousel show and the model city would swap places. The show likely to minimize costs. 
would find its home on the ground floor of this circular theater, and the model city would be displayed on the upper floor. The city would also be given a name in line with GE branding. It would be called Progress City, similar to the name of the GE Pavilion at the fair, Progress Land. But people working on the project knew what it really was. Quote, of course, the model was Walt's concept for Epcot, McGinnis explained. It was a way of showcasing Walt's big dream for Florida inside of the park he so loved in California. Throughout the summer, Walt's health continued to decline. In July, he took a vacation with his family in Vancouver, where he chartered a yacht for two weeks. But even after a break from work, he appeared tired, even fatigued. He believed the pain in his back was related to an old polo accident in which he tumbled from a horse a knot of discomfort from a spinal injury that for years he had managed with chiropractic treatments. The shortness of breath most around him believed was related to years of smoking unfiltered cigarettes. Most afternoons, the studio nurse, Hazel George, rubbed down his back attempting to ease his pain. Like many artists at WED, Hench was aware of Walt's pain and believed the outcome might at most restrict Walt's movements. Quote, he complained about his shoulder, Hench said, and his gimpy leg. In Hench's mind, this would be nothing more than a minor inconvenience. And if Walt, for some reason, eventually ended up in a wheelchair, Hench pictured it as, quote, the damnedest wheelchair we ever saw, with an experimental design arranged by the team at WED. At times it seemed clear that Walt's symptoms were larger than those from an old sports injury. However, Walt insisted that it was nothing more than chronic pain from a bad fall taken years ago, something that hopefully would be mended with surgery scheduled for November, which was one month after two important deadlines. A film he would make to present the Epcot concept to American industry and the Florida legislature, and an appearance in Mineral King, California, to solidify plans for a Disney-developed ski resort. Despite the pain and general fatigue, Walt continued to focus on projects that interested him. New Tomorrowland with its imaginative attractions, the ski resort with the Swiss-themed village, and, of course, Epcot. In these weeks, Hench could see how important the planned city was to Walt. It was, Hench said, quote, his greatest interest, it was an enlargement, it was an extension of what he'd been doing all the time, only he was going to reach more people and have more effect on their lives. It was to be a city of tomorrow and to be a showcase city, to solve urban problems, really to solve a lot of human problems. Hench watched the larger vision come together, that Epcot now wasn't just a place, but rather a visual message that people together had the ability to improve their lives through planning, technology, education, internationalism, and art. Quote, he thought he could build a kind of place, Hench said, where people could come and experience the solution to a lot of their problems in the cities, social problems. And he thought it would be a good idea that people should know something about the cultures of other people. So it really was quite a courageous thing to try and get people to bend their mind a little, to drop some of their prejudices in a very agreeable way. Even further beneath the technology and design conceits, Epcot spoke to yet another concern that had interested Walt for years, a theme that unified many of his films. Though the Disney film catalog might have topical chapters, the late 1930s focused on artistic exploration, the early 1940s on civic duty, the late 1940s and early 1950s on internationalism, and the late 1950s on American history, one dominant theme that connected the films of Walt throughout his career concerned the outsider who was accepted into a community. From The Ugly Duckling, 1931, to Dumbo, 1941, to Cinderella, 1950, to Lambert the Sheepish Lion, 1952, to Lady and the Tramp. Even films in production during 1966 focused on how outsiders found acceptance into a community through the goodwill and generosity of others. This was showcased in the current Disney film, Follow Me Boys, the story of a troubled teenager emotionally scarred by his alcoholic father who finds acceptance inside a troop of Boy Scouts. In ways, 
Epcot was Walt's attempt to create a real space where actual people found a similar type of acceptance and inclusion inside of his city with its small neighborhoods, community spaces, and shared transit. It would be a city where neighbors talked with each other while moving to and from the business center, where they enjoyed open space together, and where they also participated in the cultural activities. It was, in ways, an artistic wish parsed out in the language of architecture, the hope that through planning and technology, Walt could transfer the dreams he had arranged on the screen into real space, allowing his cinematic themes to transform the lives of real people. Walt even imagined a place for himself in this town, a place where he would be included inside the community. According to Bob Gurr, Walt talked about this on one of his research trips as the WED team flew in the company Gulfstream from California to the East Coast. Walt, seated in the club section of the plane with his seat facing a fold-out table, unrolled an architectural brown line that showed the core center of his city. He lifted a finger and touched it to an outdoor area, then looked at those around him. We're going to have a park bench right here, he said so Lily and I can people watch. Even as the project began to open more as a philosophical inquiry, a development that would not only produce better living in Epcot, but inspire it elsewhere, many at WED remained focused on the engineering challenges to develop such a city. In terms of energy, Joe Fowler understood that Walt now believed that, quote, a house there that will be completely self-sufficient. It will have its own power plant, its own electricity. There will be no garbage or trash collection. It will all be automatically taken care of with pipes that belong to the place. In his discussions with Walt, Fowler also envisioned houses powered by individual fuel cells with locally produced energy. Quote, Walt and I spent hours, for example, on one little part, visualizing an ideal community, Fowler continued, that would be so advanced from an engineering point of view that you would live in a house. There would be no extra connection storage or fuel or electricity. You would have it all self-contained once a week, we'll say. You'd put a little fuel in your fuel cell tank. That would be the source of your power. And the solid waste would be taken care of by bacterial action. George McGinnis spent months focused on integrating Walt's dream of all-electric transportation into workable arrangements with track layouts and stations. Quote, I did sketches and renderings of transportation concepts, McGinnis said. Walt asked me to do a design for a larger people mover. I also sketched a wide-body monorail, a concept for the main transportation line through the property. The technology architecture and green space slowly came together in a progression of unified plans, each one a little more sophisticated than the last. The downtown area would contain an internationally themed mall, a convention center, and a hotel at least 30 stories tall, along with various office buildings, restaurants, entertainment areas, and shops. The downtown center would be encircled by a green belt, separating the business region from the neighborhoods. Some neighborhoods would be arranged around single-family homes, others around high-density apartment buildings. Not far from the city would be the industrial park. All of it would be connected by Woodway people movers, and the city would be connected to other areas of the Disney Resort by monorail. As day guests glided along the beamway, en route to that new theme park, they could look out of their monorail windows and see the city. All of those families in their ideal homes and perhaps realize that the design process overseen by Walt didn't only produce wonders of entertainment, it could produce a city with higher goals as well. But as summer cooled into fall, as Walt felt a new weakness darkly expand inside his body, he surely sensed that he wasn't well. Yet, as best as he could, he ignored the pain and the fatigue. He was focused on creating a short film that would explain the uniqueness of Epcot to business and government leaders. 
he also moved forward with a public appearance in the Sierras to discuss, alongside the governor of California, plans to develop his ski village and recreation area in Mineral King. Whatever surgery, whatever treatments were necessary would need to wait until these two projects were done. I'll be back next Sunday with a new episode. If you enjoy this podcast, if you find it a meaningful part of your week, please support us over on Bandcamp by becoming a monthly subscriber. On Bandcamp, you'll find dozens and dozens of extra episodes, but the best reason to subscribe is to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can subscribe at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com I'll also leave a link in the show notes. Until next time, this is Todd James Pierce.